Good morning, everyone. Good morning. This is the day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. If you are able, please stand for the call to worship. Amen. Amen. Lord, as you call the world into being, you have called us together as your church. Help us to be a community that looks to you alone for guidance. We confess that we want to hold on to what we know, that we are afraid to take risks for the sake of the gospel. Forgive us when we cling to comfort, when we build barriers to protect ourselves, when we choose the familiar way. Holy Spirit, we are not ready for you, but we know that you are ready for us, ready to change our lives and our churches if we, let, if we will let you. Fill us with your mighty power and strength so that we will be equipped to serve your world and share your love with all people, walking, working, and worshiping together as one. Please, please remain standing. We're going to stand for prayer because we're going to just allow God to be worshiped and glorified. And if we can stand for games, we can stand for prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, your word says that you are spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come because we need a fresh anointing, an anointing that breaks the yoke not just in this service, not just in our communities, Lord, but in our hearts, Lord. Lord, we ask that you would just open our hearts to receive what you want to do through worship. Lord, we ask that you would open our hearts for the word being preached. Lord, you never leave us thirsty or dry when there's the unction of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask that you would just begin to move in the hearts of your people. I can't even imagine the prayers that have gone up through the years in this place. But Lord, we're gonna just shake this atmosphere. We're gonna shake our churches and community because you bind us together, together, like a three-strand cord that cannot be easily broken. Lord, open our ears, sanctify them to hear what your spirit's saying to the church today. In Jesus of Nazareth's name, amen. East Ohio 2018, you ready to worship? Yeah, let's put our hands together.
guys ready to sing? Everybody sing the word. Where we go? One, two, three,
sing you are here you are here moving in our midst I worship you I worship you you are here working in this place I worship you I worship Miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are.
You never stop waking Jesus. You never stop waking Lord. That's why I sing. We make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. Come on, if you believe it, say your way. Say way. We make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. Come on, shout it to the Lord if you believe. If you believe it's a way maker, give it up to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, we give it praise. Light in the darkness. Woo! You may have a seat. You may have to be seated. We could do that all morning. Amen. If you'd like to meet me in the book of Acts this morning in the eighth chapter. I'll be reading from the NRSV. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, get up and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home, seated in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb, silent before its shearer. So he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask, does this prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with the scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, here's water. What is it to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized them. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. Good morning. Friends, it gives me great joy to introduce our morning preacher, which is none other than Chip Freed. Chip Freed is the lead pastor at the Garfield Memorial United Methodist Church on the North Coast District. Garfield Memorial is a multi-site in a multi-ethnic ministry located in two locations in Pepper Pike and South Euclid. Since Pastor Chip arrived at Garfield Memorial in 2004, there has been significant growth in the church. The number of active members have grown from 400 to over 1,000, and the children's ministry has grown to 150. Garfield Memorial Church is the first live video venue here in the East Ohio Conference. The largest ethnic group at Garfield Memorial Church constitutes only 54% of the congregation. Chip and Garfield Memorial Church are noteworthy leaders in the multi-ethnic church movement within the United Methodist Church and beyond. 
Chip is a sought out speaker and worship leader on multi-ethnic ministry. We give thanks to God for his leadership in the church, in the United Methodist Church, here in the East Ohio Conference, and throughout the connection. Welcome, Pastor Chip Freed. All right, all right. Hey Amen. How about that band? They get on my last nerve, but they are so daggone good. If you can't preach after them, they ought to take your license away, right? Thank you, Bishop Malone. Thank you for the kind words. We all know they, they, they can't possibly be true, but I say thank God for the rumor, right? Um, in 2004, I'm picking up on that theme of called, and in 2004, um, I was asked by one of my mentors, Dr. Gerald Mann of Riverbend Church in Austin, Texas, to preach for him during that month. He was having a medical procedure done in Los Angeles, and he was going to be out of the pulpit for about a month and a half, and he didn't want to rattle the congregation much, and I had preached there before, and they knew me, so he said, Chip, how about um, you come on out? He said, you're not doing anything anyways. Aren't you a district superintendent? <laughs> like Baptist prejudice all over him, right? And um, so I talked to the bishop, and, and he allowed me to do that, and so they would fly me out to Austin every Friday and then fly me back on Sunday. And when I was going out to Austin, Texas, I didn't know there was a rule that you can't fly from Ohio anywhere west without going through O'Hare Airport. Amen? Anybody's experienced that? O'Hara is like airport purgatory. Like you have to go, right? And at that time, the Wall Street Journal said that O'Hara was running at 300% capacity. And so the five flights, connecting flights I had to go to Austin, I missed four of them. The last one was particularly bad because, you know, we got in there on time. I said, great, I'm going to make my flight. And um, we sat on the tarmac for two and a half hours because there wasn't a gate to pull up to. I had 20 minutes to catch my flight. I sprinted down to the gate. The door had closed, right? And I thought about knocking on it and saying, Lord, Lord, but I know somebody was going to say, truly, Chip, we don't know you. But anyhow, I, the door closed, and I didn't know when the door closed, like it, it's, it's like military grade, you're done, you can't get on. I said, but the plane's right there. Like, I see it right there. No, the door is closed. Uh, Mr. Free, we're sorry, you're going to miss your flight. So I went across to Chili's restaurant in O'Hare. It was right across from the gate. And uh, the fact that I looked at that plane I couldn't get on for the next 90 minutes <laughs> did not help my disposition. It was around noon. I'm going to be honest. I ordered a beer. <laughs> She's over there, isn't she? <laughs> kind of lost my place. I drank a little. I just didn't swallow. Um, <laughs> And that's what happened. That really is what happened. They walked in. I mean, they came in. They didn't just come in. They came in like on a hoverboard. There was like uh, two uh, adults, uh, obviously a couple. They were around my age. Um, they were newly tanned. He had his shirt buttoned down, you know, open to about here. Um, they obviously just came back from an exotic place. They had lays around their neck. Um, and they, and they, they just gloated in with the googly eyes and Behind me was an older woman with a young girl, and Barbie and Ken just glided right over <laughs> to, that, to that seat, and they sat down. Now, Fred Craddock, if you know him, a great teacher of preachers, Fred Craddock once said, we never so, hear so clearly as when we're eavesdropping. <laughs> I was all up in their business, man. <laughs> I want to know what's going on. And uh, it, it wasn't too hard as I, you know, uh, you know listened in. Um, it wasn't hard. What are you laughing at? You've done it too. Admit it. Um, that they had gone on like a second honeymoon. They'd been together and they were from Boston and, and they couldn't get to Hawaii except through O'Hare. And his mom lived in Chicago. And so they dropped off their daughter um, to be with their mom while they went out and had a second honeymoon. They were on their way back. And obviously they were still under the enchantment of the moment because they ordered those two little drinks with the umbrellas in it. And they were just gazing at each other's eyes. And uh, their daughter was just kind of kicking at her chicken fingers. And, and that's when the mother said, oh, Christine, Christine, I forgot. We bought you something. And she reached into her bag and she pulled out this fluorescent pink T-shirt. And she put it over her daughter. And it was way too big. And it said, come on, my parents went to Hawaii. And all I got was this lousy T-shirt. 
It was at that moment in the O'Hare airport in the midst of all my funkiness that God gave me an epiphany. I think too many times uh, when we see this gospel of Jesus Christ that we've been called to, Jesus didn't call us to believe anything. He didn't even call us to behave. Jesus showed up. All the other religious leaders that had ever lived of the great world religions, they showed up and they said, I know the way to God. They point to the way and say, follow my teaching. Every religion of the world. That's why I don't think Christianity is a religion. I don't have enough time to break that down for you. But I just wanted to give you something to go home and say, what do you say? Every religion of the world, the founders, read them, they showed up and they said, that's the way to God, follow my teaching. Jesus is the only one who showed up and said, I am the way, follow me. He didn't say to believe and behave, he said to follow. And he invited us into an incredible adventure. If you read this thing, and we're into the book of Acts, I'm going to get there in a minute, I promise. If you read this thing, he invited us into, a, into an adventure where everything's alive. Have you ever been on vacation? Like everything matters, right? Even the boring drive. You know, I took my boys up into Canada fishing a few years ago. We just got on a float plane and dropped off a little place. We drove 14 hours up, up to Cochrane, Ontario, as far as we could get. And I mean, it was a dull, boring drive, but it was pregnant with purpose. And see, when you're on an adventure, when, when, you, when you, every day you wake up knowing that God has something in store for you, Morning by morning, what? New mercies we see? That he has a plan and we're a part of it? And he invites us into it? When that happens, you're on the adventure? Even the boring stuff has meaning. So you don't sleep through worship. You don't just stand up and look, kick around the hymns. You're alive. Irenaeus, the early church father and mo the mothers of the faith, said that the glory of God is a person fully alive. And do you ever notice when you're on vacation? Anybody been on vacation, you had the problems? <laughs> like the kids got sick, the car broke down. Do you notice when you're on vacation, even the problems just become great stories at Thanksgiving? And if we are on an adventure with Jesus, we'll be sitting there saying, remember that time the boiler went out? Remember that time we didn't know how we were going to collect enough money to do it? Isn't God amazing? Because we're on an adventure. But here's the problem. Too many of us have settled for the t-shirt. See, because Christine wasn't real excited when she put the t-shirt on. Why? It realized she hadn't put her foot in the waves. She hadn't seen the whales breach off of Maui. She hadn't gone up to the volcanoes. She was just wearing the emblem of an adventure she'd never been on. And I think our churches today, unfortunately, are filled with people that could be wearing t-shirts that say, I became a Christian. And all I got was this lousy t-shirt. We've settled, friends. We've settled for souvenir faith. We have settled for so little and called it church. We have settled for so little and called it faith. And I don't want to settle anymore. Bishop mentioned we're part of the whole multi-ethnic movement, the Mosaics Global Network, and we are working diligently to try to help churches have a more credible witness for the kingdom of God. If you read Revelation 7, 9, it says every tongue, tribe, and nation will worship God. And one of our little questions that we just go around the country asking churches is, if the kingdom of heaven is not segregated, then why on earth is the local church? And I was struck by those 1968 videos the other, yesterday morning we played when the whole denomination got together and I heard the DNA of his, we're gonna deal with racial segregation, really? 87% of churches in America, and the United Methodist Church, that number is way higher, 87% of churches in America are by definition segregated along ethnic and racial lines. 87%. Duke University did a study and found out that churches are 10 times more segregated than the communities in which they reside and 20 times more segregated than the nearest public school. Brothers and sisters, it should not be so. And I know you're going to come up and lecture me. Well, we have cultural differences, and we like different music. You're lying. Shut up. We settled. <laughs> I 
I know we get caught up in personal preferences, but I don't see anything in this book that says to me, uh, what did Martin Luther King Jr. say one time? He said, God did not say to us, lo, I send you into the world, keep your blood pressure down, and I will give you a well-adjusted personality. If we don't let our devotion and our commitment to Christ precede our personal preference and our politics in whatever temporary earthly kingdom we find ourselves, we will never be the church that Jesus Christ prayed about in John 17. He said, may they be completely one. And it's a henna clause for all you Greek scholars. May they be completely one, what? So that the world will know you sent me. We're supposed to be a so that church. I tell our folks at Garfield, we have two rules if you're going to join our church. One, you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. I mean, if you're not, we're not your church. And the second thing is we tell people that come in, you're going to like 70% of what happens here. 30% you're going to hate. But guess what? When you're in your 30%, somebody else is in their 70%. And when people ask you, why do you go to church? You know, you like the music. It's too loud. You got this. You got that. Just tell them so that the world might know. Oh, Lord, I could preach on so that for a while. I got a so that anointing coming in here. Okay, I got 19 minutes. I got to tie this up. When I, and I got to be honest with you, friends, I have... You know, as much as I'm criticizing us, there's many times I've become a t-shirt wearer. There's times I settled. I started going through the motions and forgot my first love. Oh, I know it's just me in here, right? I was a full-time pastor and a part-time follower, right? Winning the ministry game and, and losing my love and my devotion and passion for Jesus. If you're here today, listen, you're not alone. We just, we just lie. We get up here, how you doing? Fine. Right? You know what psych one psychoanalyst said? When people say they're fine in the, today's day and age in America, what they mean is fearful, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. <laughs> and I've been all that. Trying to please people just so they'll stay. You ever done that? Just please people it, just so they'll stay, right? And, and uh, I, I learned something along this way in th almost three decades of doing this thing. I can't please everybody, but I can please God. And that's where we got to stay focused. And that's the lane we got to stay in. And when I settle for the t-shirt, brothers and sisters, I lean up on the book of Acts. I love Acts. I'm going to have to fly through this. Acts gives us Christianity. I don't want to romanticize it. They weren't perfect. But, but it was Christianity in its most authentic and original form. And we see, like, 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 I used to love Acts 2. When I got to Garfield, I'm like, I want to be an Acts 2 church. And we had Acts 2 meetings, and we had only about 200 of us back then, and we met in homes, and we studied Acts 2. Isn't Acts 2 just so warm and fuzzy? And it says, you know, that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to prayer, and day by day they gathered in the temple, and they shared with one another as anybody had need, and day by day they broke bread together in other homes with generous hearts, and the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Isn't that just cute? I don't want to be an Acts 2 church anymore. I don't like Acts 2 anymore. The reason I don't like Acts 2 is Jesus says, stay in Jerusalem until you receive power. Because you can't do this thing without power. If you're trying to be your own Savior and Lord, you are not qualified for the job. You do not, get it. You do not have the right to decide what's right or wrong for your life. Not, they, not if Jesus is Lord. And, and in Acts 2, he said, stay in Jerusalem until you're clothed with power from on high, and then you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, whoo, in the ends of the earth, right? How many of you, I, I'm going to talk to the preachers here, how many of you uh, took homiletics? Yeah, three of you, good. Um, and... Uh, <laughs> Hey, only 10 people have left so far. There'll be more. Um, but in homiletics, we were always taught, never say you, right, Gary? Don't say you. You say we or us or all of us. Jesus flunked homiletics. <laughs> you, you, you will be my witnesses. You, it's on us, right? 
all the millennials, get your phones out and get ready to Google. I think there's two of you here. Um, get those out. The rest of you might remember. Anybody remember when I was growing up, there was a commercial that traumatized me. Anybody remember Smokey the Bear? Do you remember his commercial? Only you can prevent forest fires. I'm like eight years old, that's traumatic. <laughs> Every night I just threw a bucket of water out my window before I went to bed, like. <laughs> Jesus says, only you, I don't have another plan. Only you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. You're gonna go to places you don't wanna go. You're gonna hang out with people you don't wanna hang out with. Because this mission is bigger than you. I heard a bishop say the mission is not the church, but the church is invited into that mission. And see, in Acts 2, they didn't go, they stayed. But in Acts 8, things get interesting. And the persecutions come, they're scattered. And they began to share the word of God wherever they go. And look at this real quick story. Philip, this is an amazing story. Philip with an encounter with a eunuch from Ethiopia. Who is this eunuch? Who is this guy? We know a lot in the Bible. He's a CFO. He's a Secretary of Treasury of Ethiopia. He's extremely, extremely wealthy. The guy owns an Isaiah scroll. Do you know how rare that was? And he can read, which was amazingly unusual in that day and age. So he's highly educated. He's extremely wealthy. He's a person of power. He has rose up the ranks at great cost because he had to become a eunuch. Because you see, in that day and age, if you were invited into the inner circle of royalty and you were not of royal blood, they could not take a chance that you could, you know, uh, pollute the bloodline of the royalty, so you were castrated. He became a eunuch. So here's a man that rose into great power and great fame and great money at great cost, and he's now on his way to Jerusalem. Well, in this book, what Jared read, he's on his way home. But it, he took a thousand mile journey that scholars say would have taken over a year. A dangerous journey. Now you think you leave a cabinet position for a year, somebody's not gonna fulfill it? So he had great cost to his reputation, to his rank. He takes a thousand mile journey. Why does somebody take a thousand mile journey that takes over a year when you're in this position? Because he got to this position, like so many people I've met, all this success, all this achievement, all this power, all this money, and you're still empty. The religions of Ethiopia couldn't fill it. His money and his education couldn't fill it. And he said, maybe there's something for me in Jerusalem. Maybe I'll go to see of the God of the Bible. I want to tell you, friends, there are people like this driving by your church every single day. And I'm getting sick and tired of us pity patting around churches with 30 or 40 people who have an attitude, who are wearing the t-shirt, and we're working so hard to attend to those needs, and we're ignoring the thousands upon thousands upon thousands of eunuchs who are driving up and down the highways every single day. And you know this man would have gotten to Jerusalem. He made this great sacrifice, and he would have gotten to the temple of Jerusalem, and he would have been turned away. Because Mosaic Law, you said, you know, they had some funky stuff. If you had mold in your house, you couldn't go in the temple. If you touched a dead body, you couldn't go in the temple. And if you were a eunuch, you could never go in the temple. Can you imagine his hurt and his disappointment? What barriers do we have up in our churches? Come on now. Seen and unseen, based on our personal preferences and our politics and our persuasions, that folks can't even get through the doors. And he would have been turned away, and he's on his way back home. And on his way back home, you know, Luke tells us where he's at. He's reading Isaiah, right? He tells us where he's at. He's in the suffering servant uh, passage in that, and he would have been reading this. Look, just down the passage of where he was reading, he would have read in Isaiah 56, do not let the foreigner join to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. And do not let the eunuch say, I am just a dry tree. For thus saith the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast to my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name. And this eunuch who's been turned away for church is going home and saying, who is this guy? 
who has become a eunuch for the eunuchs? Who is this guy who was cast out so I could be taken in? Who is this guy who became a leper for the lepers? Who is this guy who was like a sheep under the slaughter and never uttered his mouth? Who is it? He says, and just then Philip runs up to him. Says, hey, you having any trouble with what you're reading? Isn't God good? And you know, God said to Philip, go over there and join with it. You go over and stay near it, one translation say. You know why? Because it was moving. So it would have looked like this. Hey! How you doing? I see you're reading your Bible. Having any trouble with it? When's the last time you did something outrageous for God? When's the last time you just made a fool of yourself? You didn't care what people thought. You know, I, I had a pastor told me one time I was playing to the crowds, and he said, people are too big in your life and your God is too small. When is the last time you have chased a chariot? When's the last time you got out of your way? I, I, I read a guy named uh, Benjamin Me. Anybody see the movie in 2011, We Bought a Zoo? It wasn't, oh, two people, good. Um, Matt Damon will be so happy. Uh, really moved the needle there. Um, but it was a true story about Benjamin and me. He was a guy, and he, he, he and his family, and they were looking at their call in life, and they decided to buy this zoo in, uh, in the U.K., and, and um, they went and bought this zoo, and they, they bit off more than they could chew, and uh, they were trying to get it back to life, and they loved animals. And he said, suddenly my new neighbors were five Siberian tigers, three African lions, nine wolves, three bright, big brown European bears, four Asian short-clawed otters, two flamingos, a Brazilian taper called Ronnie, some large boa constrictors, and a tarantula. And you thought your congregation was tough. <laughs> it was rat infested and tragically Benjamin's wife died of an aggressive brain tumor four months after they bought that zoo. But he and his young kids said, we, we're going to fulfill this mission. And if you watch the movie, they created the zoo and it's now um, voted in 2011 the greatest wildlife habitat in, in you know, uh, Western Europe. And they asked him, how did you persevere? And you know what he said? He said, sometimes all you need is 20 seconds of insane courage. Just literally 20 seconds, 20 seconds of embarrassing bravery, bravery. And I promise you, God will do something great out of it. Can you just have 20 seconds of incredible courage? to get out of your way, to go down there. And look how courageous this was for Philip. Do you realize how different these guys were? I mean, Philip is a middle-class Jewish man. He would have gotten up every day and prayed what all middle-class Jewish men prayed. I thank you, God, that you have not created me, a woman, a slave, or a Gentile. Because you were defiled based on the people you hung around. And you had to be careful who you hung around with so that you were not defiled. And here is the most defiling person a Jewish middle class man could deal with. Here is a man who was castrated. Here is a man who is uh, a black African from Ethiopia, the, the furthest regions of the known world, right? They were the thought barbarians. Here is somebody of a whole different economic class. And God says, Philip, do you see that sexually altered, ethnically different and person over there? Go and join with him. And we're talking about a way forward. God has a way forward. <laughs> Philip! Philip, do you see that sexually altered, ethnically different foreigner in your land that you would normally have nothing to do with? Go over and join with him. Go over and get in a chariot with him. Go over there and invite him into the adventure with you. Oh, we got a boundary breaking, division wrecking God. And let me tell you, the Ethiopian's in the story, Philip's in the story, but do you see the Holy Spirit in this story? Scholars have said in Acts 8 and in Acts 9, he'll do it to Paul, and in Acts 10, he'll do it to Peter, that the God is taking more active intervention than any other time in the New Testament. He's coming in and saying, okay, Philip, look, I'm going to take you down here at the corner of I-271, right at Sugar Boulevard. In case you don't know, let me show you. I will take you there. Sit here. Okay, Philip, that's the guy. Now go. This is God's idea. God was crossing boundaries. You may not know this, friends. Every single church in the book of Acts was a multi-ethnic church. Every single church. They empowered women in incredible ways. 
They were, yeah. Oh, I, I got a couple preachers over there. They're, they're my preachers, believe me. I send them loose on you. All this white male patriarchy will just fly out the window. Come on, somebody. Hey, I got a round trip ticket. I ain't, I ain't running for anything and my allegiance is to another kingdom. This was the early church and God was, God was intentional. These, these Jewish men would have never, ever crossed these kind of lines, except it was God's idea. And God manipulated them. Let me tell you, friends, I'm gonna wrap this up. I know it's hard. I know the adventure's not easy. I know it's so tempting to settle. Make excuses, been there, done that, tried that, didn't work, right? This work is hard. This work has a cross in it. But don't forget who the author and architect of our faith is. I had a friend that told me to read this uh, memoir, and the memoir was by Diane Disney. Diane Disney was a daughter of Walt Disney, and she wrote a memoir, and, and they asked her, what was it like growing up as the daughter of Walt Disney? And she said, well, actually, our... Our, our family was pretty normal. I'd go to friends' houses. They would come to my house. We'd have dinner together. We'd share. Um, and it was pretty normal. She said, until the fourth grade, I went to fourth grade class, and uh, my uh, teacher wanted all of us to stand up and introduce ourselves and say what we had done in the summer. And she got up when it was her turn. She said, hi, my name's Diane Disney. And the, and the class went nuts. <laughs> Woo! Yeah! You know, and she started to cry. <laughs> And she said, she said, they're laughing at me. They're me, making fun of me. And the teacher said, no, no, no. They're, they're celebrating, you know, uh, you're Diane Disney. And they said Disney again. And people start, kids are cheering. She goes, no, see? They go, no, like, like you're Diane Disney. Like Walt Disney's your father. Like Mickey Mouse is your brother. <laughs> like, duh. Diane Disney said she went home that day. Her father was reading the paper as he normally did before dinner. She walked over and snatched the paper out of his hand and looked at him and said, you never told me you're Walt Disney. <laughs> oh, but my friends, she wrote after that that I spent the next three years of my life amazed at who my father is. When you think you can't do this, you ought to be amazed at who your father is. It ought to blow your mind who your father is. The father was the first and the last, the one who was and is and is to come. As the old preachers used to say, he owns the cattle on the mountains and owns the mountains too. Greater is he that is in you than the one that is in the world. Our father is exceedingly abundantly able to do more than we would ask or think according to the power. Power! <laughs> Friends, thank you. I want to be obedient to our time. Our band's going to sing us out. I was going to do an altar call, but I really got to be obedient to our time. I was going to do the altar call in honor of Mark George. Anybody know Mark George? Mark George is one of my heroes. And last time I preached up here, it was 14 years ago. It'll be 14 before they ask me again. Um, <laughs> but Mark grabbed me down by patio and he poured into me and he said, I'm so proud of you, Chip. And he said all these things that weren't true. But then he said to me, where was your altar call? And then I walked down a little further, Maurice King. Anybody remember Maurice King? Maurice King prophesied over me. I was running my own business. He said, no, you're going to be a preacher. I said, no, I will not. Yes, you will. No, I won't. Yes, you will. Don't fight with Maurice King. And I left Mark George, and I came down, and Maurice King was there, and he grabbed me. And, oh, I'm so proud of you, baby brother. And we knew you had this in you, and, and you just had to figure it out. And you're not real smart, but, boy, can you talk. You know, and he's... And then he said to me, where was your altar call? So I don't have time to do it, but I want to tell you, as the band sings today, whether you go to patio, whether you want to come down and pray, we're going to close. I'm going to, we're going to be done by nine. I promise the bishop, we've got five minutes, we'll be done. 
But if you want to come and pray with somebody or you want to come and say, I'm tired of settling. I'm tired of encouraging others when I'm discouraged myself. Just, just, just come as the band sings. Because we, we serve a God who is relentless. And he doesn't want us to settle, friends. Take the adventure. Go on a vacation. Thank you, my sister. Let's, uh, we'll leave here. Let the band, let's stand, if you will. Let's stand to our feet. And we're going to close with this song. We'll be closing right on time. But if you want to spend the 15 minutes down here in prayer, we'll do that. Um, there are restrooms in the back. You will not die. Friends, don't settle. Just say those words with me. Don't settle. Take the adventure. God be with you. God bless you.
praise the Lord for he is good. To God be the glory. Are your souls revived this morning? Praise be to God for that powerful preached word, and praise be to God for truly this time of revival and altar call. Amen. Amen. Friends, I don't want to get in the way of the Holy Spirit. Um, what I am going to invite us to do, we're going to receive the benediction. We're going to be in recess. We will begin at 9.15. But for those of you who would like to still remain in this time of prayer and celebration, we do need to clear the stage. Um, but I do want to allow for the time of prayer to continue. So come on and receive the benediction, and we will get started at 915. East Ohio, don't settle. Don't settle. Ask God to give you that 20 seconds of insane courage. What could he do? What could he do? How many minutes, how many hours with the people in this room and the congregations and the people represented, how many eunuchs could we reach? How many people that drive by our doors could we reach and change their lives so that they would know the love of God? If you felt something here today, don't you dare go home without doing something about it. Go in that spirit. Amen. <laughs>